Swayam Prabha. Digital India. Educated India. Good morning. This is the first lecture of this course, uh, which is being given on mathematics in India from uh, Vedic period to modern times. Uh, it is a novel course, uh, which tries to trace the way mathematics developed in India. Uh, the first talk is an overview talk. In this, I will try to highlight those periods in where there was a significant development of mathematics in India. I will also try to summarize uh, the special nature of mathematics as it developed in India. I would like to, for instance, emphasize the algorithmic way in which most uh, problems in mathematics were considered in the Indian tradition. So, I am flashing the outline, not going to read it out. Uh, you can just see the kind of topics we are going to cover. Uh, we will cover the development of Indian mathematics in the ancient period, indicate some highlights during that period. Then the early classical period, say 500 BCE to 500 CE, which culminated in the work of Aryabhata. Then the development of mathematics in the later classical period, from 500 in the common era to 1250. We will then go to some glimpses of the highlights of what happened during the medieval period till about 1850. Towards the end, we will discuss something about the nature of mathematics in India, how mathematics was understood, how results were proved and things like that. And then about the contemporary period, we will speak a little bit about uh, Srinivas Ramanujan, finally an overview of the history. So, one of the standard quotes on mathematics in India is this following statement from the Ganita Sara Sangraha of uh, Mahavira Acharya. It is a long uh, six verse statement, perhaps you will hear again when Mahavira Acharya's Ganita Sara Sangraha is going to be discussed. It starts by saying that mathematics is important in all areas and finally concludes by saying Bahubihi Vipralā Paihi Kim Railokye Sacharachare Yetkinchit Vastu Tatsarvam Ganitena Vinanahi. In the whole of the three worlds, there is nothing that is not uh, pervaded by mathematics. So, that is the kind of statement that uh, Mahavira Acharya is making, whether is it in astronomy or be it in architecture or be it in uh, 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 conjunction of planets, position, time, course of moon, logic, poetry, grammar. So, it is just an all purpose statement of Mahavira Acharya that uh, mathematics pervades all aspects, all subjects. This is a quotation from the 9th century work called Ganita Sara Sangraha of Mahavira Acharya. So, Ganita stands for calculation computation. Ganyate Sankhyayate Tad Ganitam is a statement due to Ganesha Daivagya, he is a commentator of Lilavati. And therefore, we can expect that Indian mathematical texts really abound in rules to describe systematic and efficient procedures for calculation. Just to give you an example, we will go to a very ancient rule. This is uh, given by Bhaskara 1. This is in his commentary to Aryabhatiya. It is just a rule for calculating the square of a number. Antyapadasya vargam kritva dvigunam tadeva antyapadam sheshapadai rahanyat Utsar Yotsarya Varga Vidhau. So, we can see the kind of calculation he is talking about. You take any number 125, first you square the last number, multiply the other two numbers by 2 and the last number. So, you get this row, then move away, remove one digit, square the next number, multiply by 2 and that number, the next row. And finally, square the last number, remove one more number, add all of them. The important thing to realize is even this very ancient rule written in 629 AD uh, actually uses uh, 
n into n minus 1 by 2 multiplications to calculate the square of a number. An n digit number multiplied by another n digit, n digit number will have n squared multiplications. But since we are squaring the same number, this 2ab factor comes in and so you are having an optimal algorithm for squaring. This is the way Indian mathematicians always try to give the best possible way of the best possible procedure for doing a calculation. Now, the word algorithm itself has a history. Uh, it was the name given to the Indian methods of doing calculation and it originates from the name of a Central Asian mathematician called Al Khwarizmi, who in the 9th century wrote a book on Indian methods of calculation. That is methods of calculation using the decimal place value system. And that book was called Hisab al Hindi. Uh, Latin versions of that book is available. The original Arabic version is not available. And uh, this was the book that introduced the decimal place value notation to the Arabic world and later on to the European world. And so the people who followed this way of calculation were called algorithmists. And uh, the word algorithm comes from Al Khwarizmi. And this algorithmic approach is not something very specific to mathematics. In fact, it pervades all Indian sciences. Most of Indian disciplines, Shastras as we call them, they do not present a series of propositions. They normally give you a set of rules, a set of procedures, which tell you how to systematically accomplish something. So, the rules given in Shastras are usually called as Vidhi, Kriya, Prakriya, Sadhana, Karma, Parikarma, Karana, these are the names. And these rules are what are usually formulated as sutra. So, the disciplines, the technical disciplines in India, they provide systematic rules of procedure rather than a set of propositions. And of course, the most canonical such uh, uh, systematic text in India is the great grammar written by Panini called Ashtadhyayi. In fact, most other disciplines and especially mathematics is extensively influenced by the method of Panini. His use of symbolic and technical devices, recursive and generative formalism and the system of conventions that govern rule application and rule interaction, all this go back to Panini and it has had a deep influence even on the modern discipline of linguistics. In fact, many scholars actually acknowledge that uh, the place Panini holds in Indian tradition is uh, something analogous to the place Euclid holds in the Greek or European tradition. And here is a quotation from Stahl, where he is saying Panini is also deriving systematically Sanskrit utterances from a set of rules. And Euclid is also deriving a set of uh, propositions from a collection of axioms. But the word deriving will have two different means, meanings in uh, these two contexts. Panini is actually generating valid utterances of Sanskrit. He is not proving theorems. Euclid is demonstrating, is proving theorems in mathematics from a set of postulates. So, in the ancient period, uh, the earliest texts in mathematics available are the texts on construction of fire altar, the Vedis. These are the Shulva Sutras. These are the oldest texts of geometry in the world. They give procedures for construction and transformation of geometrical figures. Then there are ancient astronomical Siddhantas, which deal with astronomy. When we come to the classical period, starting from Panini, we then have the Chandas Sutra of Pingala, which initiated combinatorics. We have some mathematics in the Jaina tradition, in the Jaina text. Then more crucially, the idea of 0 and the decimal place value system developed in this period. And all this culminated in the mathematics and astronomy that is found in the text Aryabhatiya of Aryabhata, which was written in 499 of the common era. Most of the standard procedures in arithmetic, algebra, geometry, trigonometry were perfected and many more things which were used in astronomy like the indeterminate equations, sign tables, all these things were perfected by the time of Aryabhata. So, the ancient Shulva Sutras deal with lot of things, units of measurement, marking directions, 
construction of rectangles, squares, trapezia, transformation of squares. And it has the first uh, oldest statement of uh, geometry, the theorem which we attribute to Pythagoras commonly. It is called the Bhuja Koti Karna Nyaya in later uh, Indian mathematical texts. It is the sum of the two sides of a rectangle, the squares, sum of the squares of two sides of a rectangle is equal to the square of the diagonal. This is the rule as stated in Bodhayana's uh, Shulva Sutra. Dirga Chaturashrasya Akshnaya Rajuhu Parshvamani Tiryangmani Chayat Prithagbhute Kurutaha Tat Ubhayam Karoti. There are even more complicated rules of adding squares. Then there is a rule for approximate conversion of a square into a circle, uh, which uh, leads to a value of pi around 3.08. Then there is a very interesting formula for the square root of 2, it is called Dvikarani uh, and it is accurate up to several decimal places as you can see. Finally, all this geometry is used in constructing altars. This is the rule in Katyayana Shulva Sutra. The problem is how to construct a square which is n times uh, the area of a given square. And uh, Katyayana Shulva Sutra gives a very interesting geometrical formula n plus 1 a by 2 whole square minus n minus 1 a by 2 whole square is n, n a square. It is using this very interesting algebraic result to calculate uh, the side of a square which is n times in area of the given square. Pingala's uh, Chanda Sutra ushered in combinatorics and this is a very interesting diagram known as the Meru Prastara which appears in Pingala's uh, Chanda Sutra. It gives you the what we now call as the binomial coefficients NCR. They arise very naturally when you want to count how many meters are there which have n syllables but in which r number of gurus appear that is the NCR as we shall see later. The decimal place value system arose in the ancient period. The main thing about the decimal place value system is that it is an essentially an algebraic concept. The number 5203 written as 5 times 10 cubed, 2 times 10 squared and 0 times 10 plus 3 is something akin to an algebraic polynomial 5 x cubed, 2 x squared plus 0 x plus 3. It is this algebraic feature of place value system that enabled uh, the Indian mathematicians to give systematic and very interesting procedures for making calculations and they became the standard methods of calculation all the world over. Sometimes the Indian books do give some special techniques also which are essentially originating out of the place value system. For instance, the commentary Buddhi Vilasini uh, of Ganesha Daivagya and Leelavati, it discusses what is currently popularly known as the Vajrabhyasa method of multiplication, vertical and crosswise method of multiplication. The history of decimal place value system goes back to the Vedas. They use the system to the base 10 very naturally. The Upanishads talk of 0 and infinity. Panini's Ashtadhyayi has a notion of uh, low power, which is akin to what is called a 0 phoneme, 0 morpheme in linguistics. There is this idea of Shunya in the Bauddha philosophy, the idea of Abhava in the Nayaika philosophy. Pingala's Chanda Sutra uses 0 as a marker. It is not uh, clear whether at that time the idea of 0 as a number was known. Now, soon enough, the idea of place value system uh, became so common that philosophical works uh, such as Vasumitra's uh, Buddhist text and even commentaries on Yoga Sutra started explaining the speciality of the place value system. Here is a quotation from the Vyasa Bhashya on Yoga Sutra. Yathaika rekha shatasthane shatam dashasthane dasha eka cha ekasthane yata chaikatve pistri mata chochyate duhita cha swasa chet. Just as a lady is understood as a mother, daughter in law or a sister, uh, a, a line which appears at different places that is number 1 which appears at different places will have different values 100 or 10. So, like this, this issue became well known in the circles of philosophy also and got discussed. And uh, one of the oldest uh, places where the place value system occurs explicitly is in a book called Vridha Yavana Jataka written by Spujit Vaja around 270 in the common era. 
and by the time of Aryabhatta's Aryabhatiya, all calculations were formulated with the place value system. Here is an inscription in Gwalior which is giving the number 270, I think it is appearing here. Uh, and there are many inscriptions in Southeast Asia, in Java and various other places around early 7th century, uh, which uh, give numbers in the place value system with 0 also. Now, this Indian place value system was acclaimed universally. This is a statement in the 7th century by a Syrian uh, bishop, Severus Sebokht, who is the sort of saying that the Greeks seem to think too much of themselves, but they really do not know the basic methods of calculation that the Indians have discovered and uh, they better know that there are others who also know something of science. Here is Ibn Sina, a very famous philosopher in uh, the West Asian region in 10th century. He is saying that he learned the methods of calculation, the Indian methods of calculation from a vegetable vendor. So, this was the way uh, that the place value system really revolutionized calculation all over the world. There is more modern quotation by Laplace and Gauss saying that uh, this is indeed one of the most wonderful discoveries in the history of mathematics. Now, by the time when we come to Aryabhatiya in 500 CE, it discusses the what is called as parikarma logistics, methods of calculation, square, square root, cube, cube root, areas of triangle, circle, trapezia, approximate value of pi, computing sign tables, problems to do with the intercepted arcs in a circle, progressions, rule of 3, arithmetic of fractions and finally, something very interesting called as Kuttakara, which was perhaps Aryabhata's own invention, uh, which is the method of solving linear indeterminate equations. So, this is the kind of sign table that Aryabhata came up with and it has later on been systematically improved in India. This is by Govinda Swami in 9th century and this improved table is due to Madhava. When we come to the later period, we have luminaries like Parahamira, Bhaskara who wrote commentaries on Aryabhata, Brahmagupta, one of the most uh, celebrated mathematicians of India. In Varahamira's uh, Brihat Samhita, which is a compendium, there is a chapter on perfumery and there he is introducing combinatorics ideas and he is explaining that uh, 1820 various perfumes can be formed by choosing 4 out of a collection of 16. And to calculate the 16 C 4, he gives a different kind of a Meru Prastara, he is giving a different kind of a table. Uh, here the first column natural integers the second column sum of natural integers, the third column is the sum of sums of natural integers, fourth column is and it is based upon the recurrence relation which is equivalent to single R's recurrence relation. Brahma Sputta Siddhanta Brahma Gupta, it is a text on astronomy, it has two chapters in mathematics, chapter 12 is called, 13 is called Ganita Adhyaya and chapter 17 is called Kuttaka Adhyaya, chapter 12 is Ganita Adhyaya. 17 is Kuttaka Adhyaya. Kuttaka Adhyaya deals with the most ideas in algebra. In Brahma Gupta, you will for the first time find the arithmetic of negative quantities, calculations with 0 and then detailed treatment of equations and even introduction of complicated equations known as the Varga Prakriti, which became a very important equation in the Indian mathematical tradition. Brahma Gupta also gave very interesting results such as this uh, equation for the diagonals of a cyclic quadrilateral, a quadrilateral which is inscribed in a circle. He gave a formula for the diagonals of a cyclic quadrilateral in terms of the sides and an expression for the area of the cyclic quadrilateral, which is a generalization of the formula that perhaps all of you know as the Heron's formula for the area of a triangle. <coughs> Brahmagupta of course, mentioned that this formula is applicable to quadrilaterals and triangles. He gave some interesting properties of equations of this kind, these are called the Varga Prakriti equation. 
he was the first person to formulate a property called as Bhavana that given one solution you can go to another solution. We will discuss this later during the course. But this enabled later on Indian mathematicians to work out a very systematic uh, algorithm. Uh, this one of the most famous algorithms in Indian mathematics called as the Chakravala and it enables you to solve equations. This is a very famous problem x squared minus 61 y squared is equal to 1. You have to solve for x and y in integers and as you can see the solutions are about uh, 1 trillion, 1 1.7 trillion and uh, 226 million. So, these are very high numbers, this is the lowest solution of this equation. After Bhaskaracharya, who in his book uh, in 1150 solved this equation by a very simple method, this table tells you the method. This problem again came up 500 years later when Fermat posed this as a problem to the British mathematician. Ideas of calculus started developing and they arose uh, in the context of astronomy. The idea of instantaneous velocity became important because especially to understand the motion of moon, one needed to know uh, uh, the rate of variation of its position and one found that the, even the rate of change of its position was continuously changing and the idea of instantaneous velocity arose this way. Now, there was a common means conception till 50, 60 years ago in modern times that uh, Bhaskaracharya II 11, in 1150 AD was the last important mathematician in Indian mathematics. After the birth, people were just repeating what was done in the earlier books or they had forgotten mathematics altogether. It is only in the last 50, 60 years that the works of later mathematicians have been studied and understood and actually the picture is quite different. Uh, first of all around 1200 works in mathematics started appearing in regional languages. Ganita Sara Kaumudi is in Prakrit, Vyavahara Ganita is in Kannada, Pavaluri Ganita is in Telugu. These are very important works written around 13th century, 12th century. Ganita Kaumudi of Narayana Pandita is a great advance of Bhaskaracharya Slilavati. A large part of our course will be devoted to a study of that. Then there arose a school in Kerala, which had very special contributions to make the Kerala School of Astronomy, initiated by Madhava, then Parameshwara, then Nilakantha Somayaji. They revised the older astronomical models and came up with a new astronomical model, but Madhava is more well known for his discovery of infinite series for pi, sin and cosine and they, the proofs of all these results of Madhava were written down in a very famous uh, Malayalam book called Yukti Bhasha written in 1530. Mathematics continued in Maharashtra and Kashi uh, with uh, scholars such as Gyana Raja, Ganesha Daivagnya, Surya Dasa. They wrote proofs on Bhaskara's results. Trigonometrical results were discovered by Munishwara Kamalakara. Savai Jaisima in uh, Jaipur, he built these uh, five observatories uh, which were very important at that time to correct the older astronomical calculations. The Kerala school of astronomy also continued. Uh, the last work was uh, Shankaravarman's uh, Sadratnamala in 1830. There was an astronomer called Chandrasekhar Samanta in Orissa, who in fact uh, gave by traditional methods all the major lunar inequalities in 1869. So, just to tell you the kind of work, Narayana Pandita even considered topics like magic squares as serious mathematical topics and came up with very interesting way of uh, constructing magic squares, several very new algorithms. This is what is called as the folding method of calculating magic squares. This is the infinite series for the ratio of the circumference to diameter discovered by Madhava, the Kerala mathematician. He not only discovered the infinite series, that is a very slowly convergent series, that 1 minus 1 by 3 plus 1 by 5 minus 1 by 7. If you calculate 50 terms of that series, you get only one decimal place in the uh, expansion of pi. So, Madhava at the same time gave what are known as the end correction terms. So, this is the first end correction term due to Madhava. Then there is another end correction terms. It is these end correction terms which give you a more accurate and more accurate result, even if you sum only 50 terms in the Madhava series. Incidentally, that series due to Madhava is also known as the Leibniz series. It was rediscovered by Leibniz in 1674. So, using his uh, correction, 
Madhava was able to give the value of pi correctly to 30, 11 decimal places uh, just by using 50 terms in his series with the end correction term. So, we can briefly sketch this history of pi as a typical of the way mathematics developed across different cultures. Uh, we see Aryabhata's value 3.1416, which is accurate up to 4 decimal places, the Shulva Sutra value, which is accurate up to 1 decimal places, the Jain text used root 10, Archimedes gave this standard inequality 3 10 by 71 less than pi less than 3 1 by 7. The Chinese mathematician Su Chung Chi had this 355 by 113, which is accurate up to nearly 7, 6 to 7 decimal places. But after this, we see Madhava coming up with 11 decimal places between Aryabhata to Madhava. Then Madhava's result was based upon infinite series. All these, most of these results are actually based upon uh, cal brute force calculation with uh, approximating the area of a circle by polygons, Alka, Shi, Viete, etc. Newton again came up with an infinite series around uh, 1665. Then there are various other things, but we can see in recent times, Ramanujan in 1914 came up with a very interesting series for pi using modular equation and that created a small record at that time uh, at the 1980s that people calculated pi to about 17 million decimal places. Today's achievement is about 5 trillion. But the equally important are these exact results for pi. You can see Madhava has all these exact results, which were later on repeated by others. James Gregory's tan inverse series, Leibniz series, Sharp series, all these are contained in Madhava's work. This is the series given by Ramanujan in his 1914 paper. The idea of instantaneous velocity also led to uh, more complicated derivatives. The derivative of sine function as a cosine function was well known by the time of uh, Bhaskara. Dilak and Thais formulating the derivative of the sine inverse function as 1 over square root of 1 minus x squared uh, in this words. Now, again till about 50, 60 years ago, uh, people had studied only, I mean the modern scholars had studied only the basic texts of Indian mathematics. So, they had the sort of idea that Indian somehow enunciated lot of results but they did not seem to have any method for arriving at these results uh, or at least those methods were very obscure. So, it is only in the last 50, 60 years that many of the commentaries to the original text people started studying. Traditionally, such issues that how to obtain results, how to understand them etcetera have been dealt with in detailed bhashyas or commentaries. This is not just true for mathematics that if you pick up any basic text even Bhagavad Gita to understand it uh, in a very serious manner, you have to take recourse to the detailed commentaries which are written on them. And these commentaries continued to be written till recent times, they played a very vital role in the traditional scheme of learning. As far as mathematics is concerned, it is in these commentaries that we find what are known as upapattis or yuktis, they are something similar to demonstrations or rationale or proofs in mathematics. The one of the oldest works, available works which has Upapattis is a Bhaskara 1's commentary on Aryabhatiya. But of course, the most detailed exposition of Upapattis is found in the Malayalam text Yukti Bhasha written in 1530. Now, as regards Upapatti, what was a Upapatti supposed to do? What is the nature of this? This is best captured by this verse of Bhaskara. Upapattim vina proud him, proud us abhasu naiti ganako, without the proof, a mathematician will not be considered as a scholarly mathematician in any assembly of mathematician, nisam shayona svayam, nor will he be free of any doubts regarding the results that he is enunciating. So, it is for this reason that uh, I am going to discuss upapattis or proofs, that is what Bhaskara is explaining in his commentary on Siddhanta Shiromani. The same point is repeated, of course, Ganesha is a follower in the tradition of Bhaskara, he is writing a commentary on Lilavati in 1540 explaining these proofs. Again, Nirbhranto va ritetam suganaka sadasi praudhatam naiti chayam, that a person who does not know Upapattis will not be without confusion, nor will he be considered as a serious mathematician. Now, so 
the basic purpose of upapatti is uh, sort of clearly stated uh, to be to remove confusion and doubt regarding the validity and to obtain uh, assent uh, in the community. It is something like uh, uh, sending a paper and getting it peer refereed and uh, getting it published. It does not mean that uh, that result is going to stand for all times for all uh, ages. Uh, that was the ideal of proof in the Greco-European tradition that does not seem to be the kind of ideal that the Indians are enunciating while doing mathematics. In fact, the uh, detailed study of uh, proofs in uh, Indian mathematics uh, shows that there are fundamental differences between the idea of proof as we know from the Greco-European tradition and the idea of upapatti in Indian mathematics. First of all, the Indian mathematicians are very clear that uh, proofs are needed, upapattis are needed. Uh, a result even if verified in hundreds of cases does not mean that it is proved in mathematics. So, only when you can give some logical argument or some other argument uh, can you say that uh, it is a valid mathematical result. And several commentaries are written uh, listing such uh, upapattis and the upapattis like as we know proofs in modern mathematics, uh, they are written in a sequence that you go from known result to newer result and from them to later result. So, you have a sequence of uh, establishing results and the understanding is that uh, it is by giving proofs we are clear how the result is to be applied and understood. The proofs may many times depend upon experimentation, this is something which is new. Uh, we may be doing it in our mathematics teaching, but the Euclidean ideal of proof is that the proof is something which is very abstract and should not be dependent on experimentation should not be dependent on even our understanding of what is the nature of the mathematical object. But the Indian uh, proofs were always, uh, they could involve experimentation, they could involve an understanding of the explicit use of the nature of the object. Another crucial thing is that uh, what is called the proof by contradiction, the tarka it is called in Indian mathematics that was employed. This reductio ad absurdum was employed. Uh, to understand the non-existence of certain mathematical quantities, but it was not employed to establish the existence of a mathematical object whose existence would not otherwise be accessible to us by any other means. So, Tarka was not considered as an independent pramana. So, existence of quantities cannot be established by merely proving that their non-existence is inconsistent with whatever we know. But, uh, by giving a means or an access to the way their existence can be understood by us. This is something known as the constructive philosophy in today's mathematics. And uh, there is no ideal that proofs will give uh, irrefutable demonstration or will give us the absolute truth of a mathematical proposition. There were no idea that you fix one set of postulates once and for all and derive all the results. And uh, while so many symbolisms and symbolic techniques were used, uh, formalization of mathematics was not something that was attempted in Indian mathematics. Now, coming to more contemporary times, this uh, issue of proof became something uh, very crucial in understanding the mathematics of uh, Srinivas Ramanujan. When Ramanujan sends his results in 1913 in a long letter to Hardy, which had more than 100, 120 results. Uh, Hardy immediately responds by saying, this is all fine, this is looking very interesting, but where are the proofs? Uh, you please send me the proofs of all these results. Uh, of course, they were not so trivial that Hardy, Hardy could prove it for himself straight away on a piece of paper or something like that. So, he demanded the proofs be given. And Ramanujan, there is a very famous letter he sends to Hardy in 1913, saying that he has a systematic method for deriving all the results, but that cannot be explained in a short communication. And he thinks that he has a uh, new methodology for doing things and uh, he anyway, but he says that why do not you check some of this result and be convinced that what I am writing is uh, valid and that should convince you that there is something interesting in what I am doing. Now, the issue is important uh, because uh, uh, for instance, there is this notebook of Ramanujan. Uh, which is the uh, set of all results that he noted prior to going to England. And uh, later analysis in the last 25, 30 years shows that uh, there are more than 3000 results these notebooks contain. 
Hardy initially thought that two thirds of them were already well known, but uh, now the understanding is more than two thirds were not known at the time Ramanujan was uh, recording these results in the notebook. And almost all the results are correct, uh, perhaps no more than 5 to 10 are incorrect. This is the current assessment of the results that uh, Ramanujan wrote down in his notebook. There is of course, a notebook of the work that he was doing in the last year of his life 1919 to 20, uh, which was uh, lost seemingly and it was recovered in 1975 in the Trinity College library by Professor G. Andrews. It is called the last notebook and uh, results in that are still being established by the mathematicians of present day and this contains whole lot of results like this. So, what I was trying to say was that the Greco-European tradition of mathematics almost equates mathematics with proof. And uh, the way mathematical results are discovered therefore, is uh, hardly understood. It is vaguely termed as intuition, natural genius, etcetera. And uh, there is an understanding that mathematical results are non-empirical and therefore, there is no access to them except by rigorous logical argumentation. Of course, there are philosophers of mathematics who do argue that uh, this philosophy of mathematics is uh, confusing or barren. Uh, this philosophy does not explain most of the history of mathematics, the way mathematics is done. Either it was done in earlier times or even the way mathematics is being done presently. In the Indian tradition, the understanding was that uh, proof is only one of the aspects of mathematics. It is important. Uh, mathematical results were not thought of to be non-empirical. Mathematics was not thought of to be a science different from other sciences. Its results were equally contestable and falsifiable and they could be validated in diverse ways. Uh, proof was important, but they were more for uh, obtaining assent for one's results. Uh, so, the process of mathematical discovery and the mathematical justification or in some unison in the way the Indians have understood mathematics. Long time ago, when uh, Ramanujan's letter arrived in England, uh, the confusion that Hardy and Littlewood had, uh, Bertrand Russell wrote to one of his friends that uh, Hardy and uh, Littlewood seem to have discovered a second Newton in a Hindu clerk. Uh, but if uh, some comparison is to be made uh, regarding Ramanujan, uh, he is more in the line of uh, Madhava, both in the kind of topics like infinite series, transformations of them continued fractions and transformations of them, uh, handling iterations. Uh, he is indeed a successor of uh, the great genius Madhava, who was one of the pioneers of calculus. I have tried to uh, extract a review of uh, a recent book on mathematics in India by Professor David Mumford, the well known Fields medalist. The main point Professor Mumford is trying to emphasize that by studying Indian mathematics or the history of mathematics in India, what one can understand is that indeed mathematics can be done in different ways. The muse of mathematics can be wooed in many different ways and her secrets teased out of her and so they were in India. And one should not just confuse the fact that absence of rigorous mathematics in the Greek style uh, means that the rest is not mathematics at all. And he cautions that uh, most of uh, interesting mathematics uh, that we use today which was developed in 16th, 17th, 18th century was, in, was indeed done by abandoning the Greek canon of uh, doing mathematics. Uh, this is the kind of understanding that scholars are arriving at the importance of knowing a different tradition of mathematics like the Indian tradition. Another very interesting thing is the question of uh, uh, the history of science in recent times. That uh, ever since the work of Needham, it has generally been understood that till 16th century, uh, the Chinese science and technology seemed to be in considerable advance over science and technology in Europe. And then after Needham's work, the question that Needham almost made it a, uh, an important focus was why modern science did not emerge in China and did not emerge in non-Western societies. Now, uh, when we study mathematics in India, for instance, we notice that uh, many of hallmarks of uh, modern science such as development of calculus, infinite series, uh, etcetera or development of new astronomical uh, models of the planetary system. Uh, they were all there in the Kerala work of 14, 15, 16th century. So, uh, 
a very crucial question that we should understand is why science did not flourish in non Western societies at the 16th century. And it is even more important for today's purpose uh, to have some idea of how science would have developed, uh, how the science today could have been if uh, the non Western societies had continued developing science along the lines that they had laid down for themselves earlier, uh, maybe with many modifications, uh, maybe with uh, some transformations in interaction with the modern science developed in the Europe and subsequent times. Uh, it is only by that kind of uh, speculation, we can come to some understanding of, of the great geniuses of modern times in India such as Ramanujan, Bose, Prafula Chandra Ray or Raman and many others. So, to summarize the development of mathematics in India, that uh, the main thing was that the complex mathematical problems were not shunned. Even if complete solutions to them were not found, approximate uh, less than perfect solutions were accepted and then developed into better and better solutions. And uh, the idea was always uh, was in simplicity of mathematical procedure. And by this Indians were able to do quite a bit, they could get the basic theorems of plane geometry by the time of Shulva Sutras, they could establish most of our arithmetic algebra geometry and trigonometry by the time of Aryabhata. By the time of uh, Bhaskara too, they could solve complicated uh, quadratic indeterminate equations or by 14th, 15th century calculus exact uh, series for sign and very accurate sign tables which are all very important were found. So, the crucial thing is the explicitly algorithmic and computational nature of Indian mathematics. And this seems to have persisted uh, till recent times and to some extent uh, Srinivas Ramanujan as I told you could be thought of as a, an inheritor of the traditional Indian methodology. And perhaps it is important uh, that we should uh, have a detailed understanding of the development of mathematics in India uh, to understand the way Indians approached uh, many complex problems even in other sciences. And needless to say, uh, it is very important that uh, we should teach uh, the highlights of this great tradition of mathematics in our, to our students in schools and colleges. And uh, I think courses like this uh, will help in sort of uh, formulating that kind of a work. So, with that I, I complete this initial overview and thank you very much.